Seventeen. She doesn't mean I have a disease, of course. That's the clearings in which we're standing. We're in the middle of the bush in my wonderful office here. This is a piece of pottery similar to the one that Steph had. I'm just going to quickly flip it over for you like that. And it was also probably used as a bank in a termite mound. I don't know if it's as old as 800 years, but it's certainly pretty old. And just an unbelievable find that Steph had there. Now, over here is my good friend uh, Johnny the Giraffe. His name changes on a frequent basis. Uh, he is dead, as you can see. In fact, he is long dead. And he was probably killed by lions or hyenas. But everything out here is a food source or a home for something else. Now, have a look closer down here. You can see on the edge there a little sort of uh, waxy knoll, if you like, lit by my little lamp. There it is. Now, what we're going to do is take this microscope and we're going to pop it over the top of this waxy knoll and I'm going to show you what actually lives here. It's unbelievable. Now, we're going to go across the microscope view now and there, everybody, is the entrance hole for a stingless bee's nest. And we've just had the bees coming out and I wonder if they'll come out again. There we are. There they are. See the little bee just laying on more wax? And they're living inside the brain case of Johnny the giraffe. Look at the mouth parts going, putting the wax in the right place, using the legs, using the incredibly skillful mouth parts and even the antenna. There are two of them there. So there'll be a colony of probably up to, you know, 50 or 60 underneath here living in the brain case of Johnny the giraffe. And they'll be making a very sweet honey. Well, it's a kind of watery sweet honey, very much prized by local people. But normally, these bees live in trees. They don't normally live in the skulls of long dead giraffe. But, as you can see, Johnny, although he had to sacrifice his life to some of the predators of this area, all is not lost. His contribution to the unbelievable ecology of this area continues. Spectacular stuff. Now, there are leopards all over the place. I think we'll go back to the old girl, nine years old, Shadow. Now, we're still with these leopards. Welcome back, everyone. Oh, the other thing is, look, yeah, VM spotted it as well. The smallest carnivore in Africa, the dwarf mongoose, is hiding from the leopard. Now, if a leopard saw one, it would chase it. They're tiny, they're a couple of inches long. The gregarious mongoose species. And we can hear the leopard calling in the background, so let's leave the little mongoose. Aren't they sweet? And go across to the leopard again. Where's she gone? There she is. She's desperately calling for the, the cub, a tiny little cub, about three months old. But there's a young male here, her son from her last litter. She's calling louder and louder, getting more and more desperate. Normally she'd use that soft little oh, oh, she's doing now. But she's using a much louder call because she's not getting a response. That was almost a full roar. Look how close she is to us. Isn't this amazing? You're on a live African safari and we have a female leopard near four feet from the front of the car. She keeps coming back to this area where we are now, searching for the cub. And I'm really starting to get worried that that young male might have managed to catch that cub. Look at that golden African light on a live African safari for the Father's Day weekend. Wouldn't want to be anywhere else but right here. Keeping searching, she's actually heading back to where, where that young male was. Okay, let's have a 
than that. But while we keep following the story, let's go back to Jamie with the other leopard and hyena. This is the most incredible sighting. I'm so glad that we could share it with you live. Mvula is still here. We returned back to the side of the carcass because I couldn't find him in the dense vegetation. And all of a sudden, he snuck up right behind me. Now, I'm going to have to reposition to show you exactly what I mean. Oh, hold on. I think Brian can get a shot from where he is. Hello, boy. And off he goes. I thought he was going to challenge the hyenas once again. He's hungry enough to do so. He's got a little bit of a flap to his belly. And on this really special Father's Day, for you to have met one of the most famous leopard dads, probably in the world, if I have to be completely honest, well, it doesn't get more perfect than that. And to watch this live, if you think that this is a sighting that we just get every day, I have to tell you something. I have never, ever seen a leopard steal from a hyena like that before and then get pushed out again. And he's still slinking about the outskirts, making his way closer and closer. Here he goes. Vula, courageous and dominating, even now that he is no longer thought to be the dominant male leopard. And very good afternoon to Jessica, who was wondering what is the biggest animal that we've ever seen a leopard pull up into a tree on drive. Now for our live drives, probably some of the biggest have been animals or antelope species like kudu. And hold that thought I just want to go back a little bit in case he's still here but I have heard while we try and find our leopard I'll stay here for now and I'm gonna go search for him I have heard of a male called the Anderson male who lives just a few miles to the west of us I've heard of him hoisting baby giraffe up into trees uh, from talking of the largest things down to one of the smallest things, let's find out what scaly creature Steph has found. Now one of my most favorite things everybody is lifting up stumps and having a look at what lives underneath. You're back on the bushwalk with myself Steph and we have been walking around in the bush over here looking for just such a surprise. Right at the end of my stick is a snake. Have a look at this. It's a centipede eater. It's going underground at the moment. <laughs> See if I can. Oh, I just lost it. But the good thing is, is that there's also a scorpion here. And it's one of the nasties. Have a look at this. There we go. That is an olive thick-tailed scorpion. And let me tell you, if you get stung by one of them, that'll be the end of my show. Let's come this side. Here we go. Here it is right here. We just got to get Jandre through the bush. Here it is right here at the end of my stick. Now you don't want to get too close to these little guys because that tail there packs a big wallop. It feels like taking a piece of hot steel and putting it out in your finger. That's how sore it is. I once had one in my shirt and it stung me on the back when I was putting my shirt on, kept me bouncing around for quite some time. Now obviously, there's a good way of knowing which scorpions you can toy with and which scorpions you can't. You have a look at the pincers, you can see that these pincers are relatively frail and thin looking. Have a look at that. When you compare the pincers to the thickness of the tail, you can see that this scorpion absolutely relies on catching prey with its pincers. Careful your knee. Yeah, <laughs> don't worry. And back on the cover there. And that, everybody, olive thick-tailed scorpion. Yay! All right, time for an update. And you're going over to Brent. I Jamie, excuse me. You're going over to Jamie. Oh, everybody, have a quick look at this. What do you think that is? Floating in the middle of a jar. We're about to go back to an 
a break everyone so i'm just going to quickly reveal it to you it is one of those scorpions that steph was looking at but a much thinner tailed one come back to see the great leopards of this place the unbelievable hyenas and the stuff on the floor we'll see you in just a little while right everyone on the internet i hope you're enjoying this good grief I suppose people must be wondering what's going on around my neck. Well, this is a black mamba skin that I thought I would amusingly place here. Um, <laughs> but so much excitement going on out here. We've still got all the levers. I, of course, can see exactly what's going on everywhere here. Jamie and Brent and Steph. Now, it doesn't seem to be that all the leopards are running around at the moment, which is fantastic. Well, it's not so fantastic. Why don't we have a quick look at the rover? And what we'll do is cut across to the Juma Dam Camp first. I think if we can, we'll just move in there. No, we won't. We'll stay on me. Okay, we'll stay on me. <laughs> and let's see what else we have underneath the microscope here. And there is the microscope. And is everyone. We did a little quiz yesterday when we were in our rehearsal. Turn me up a bit. Sorry, I believe my audio is quite soft. I think it's probably because... There we go, that's a bit better. Okay, maybe it's because I've got this back mamba skin over me. Anyway, that is the claw, everyone, of a lion. And I think that's rather remarkable. Now, I just want to ask Kirsten if we're ready to do a little rover test, are we? Okay, we're going to go to the rover when we go to TV. Anyway, that's the case of, or that's the microscope look at a lion's claw. How is that? How is my audio now? Right, I think it was definitely the uh, black mamba skin that seemed to have been causing a bit of a problem around my neck. Right, out of microscope now, uh, you can see I've undone my black mamba scarf, and here is the incredible lion's claw. Isn't that fantastic? So it's about the size of my thumb. Unbelievable. Now I want to also show you a snake or the snake's eye. Now Steph, Steph had that unbelievable snake. He, of course, has an eye second to no one in the bush. And now we have a vine snake in this jar, uh, gently floating in formalin, uh, not very delicious, of course, but there is its face. And what I'm gonna try and do now is get you a view of its eye with the microscope. I just think this sort of technology is so fantastic. We're able to get these really incredible close-up views. Now, let me just try and focus before you cross it, go across. There you are. Have a look at this. Or not. There we are. Isn't that spectacular? That is the eye of a vine snake, everyone. And I know it's a bit grim watching bits of it floating by, but I just find it absolutely astounding. Now, we're going one minute to TV, everyone, so I'm going to take this down. And then I'm going to explain to the TV that we have the rover and that we have, of course, the Jumadam cam. So much of technology. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to be silent now, everyone. You haven't lost the feed. Keep watching, and like I said, it's wonderful to have you with us. It does feel like we've got a whole lot of our regulars patting us on the back and egging us on, and it's just a great encouragement. And clearly the animals of this area decided that your encouragement was well worth it. They've all come out in force, en masse. Right, 20 seconds to go. Here we go, everyone. The rover is about to make its world premiere.
Welcome back, everybody. I hope that you're enjoying this astonishing Father's Day weekend special. Hashtag Safari Live. If you want to talk to us, ask us questions, send us comments. We are live from the middle of the Kruger National Park, an iconic national park on the northeast corner of magnificent South Africa. We've got Brent out with leopards. We've got Jamie out with leopards and hyena and Steph scouring the bush for scorpions and snakes and all sorts of things. And from my office tent here in the middle of a wonderful clearing, we've got some incredible technology. We've got this micro scope which we used to tell you now we're going to cut across to the waterhole camera there there you can see the waterhole camera without an animal in it but Ronald the rover is sitting there next to the water and we're now going to cut to his view of things there he is I will now drive him slowly forward and attempt not to give him a swim because Ronald doesn't like swimming he ain't so good in the water now we just before you, well, I mean, we did have some buffalo earlier on, but you had all that leopard action, so we didn't come and have a look. But just have a look at what Ronald can do, and it does give us the most amazing view of the world. And when the buffalo come up and sniff at him and the zebra do the same, it is just so very special. This is a water hole, of course, one of the last remaining bits of water, and it is pumped from the other side from what you would call in the States a bore, I oh know what we would call a borehole and I think you would call a well. There's a pump there that fills this pan and the pan of course is feeding beautiful animals that come down to drink during the dry season. We are in the sort of throes of a fairly substantial drought at the moment. So that water hole as the dry season continues is going to become more and more important for the incredible animals of this wilderness. Let's head back across to that lovely male leopard, my favorite, Cindy Lair. Welcome back. Shadow is still walking around, calling around us, but it just was such a beautiful Thank shot you of young Cindy Lair sitting on top of that big termite mound beautiful chorus grass in front of his face lovely late afternoon african light coming through remember you're with us on a live african safari and uh, if you want to ask us any questions use the hashtag safari live on twitter and remember tomorrow is father's day if you want to send a shout out to your dad on nat geo wild remember to get those things through on hashtag safari live Okay, so we're going to try to catch up with that female again. She seems to be moving through there. I'm really hoping we don't find her uh, finding her latest cub's carcass, but that is a possibility. Hi, Adala. Welcome on the back of the safari vehicle. Adala's saying how awesome it must be to hear the meow of a large leopard. Strangely enough, Dala, a meow is one of the only sounds leopard can't make. They have got a very different type of bone in their neck compared to a domestic cat. So a domestic cat has a solid hyoid bone and that's where they create their vocalizations and they go meow. But a leopard has an elastic cartilaginous hyoid bone that vibrates and that's how they're able to get that that deep 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 noise we're hearing now if you had to describe the way a leopard calls it's almost like someone sawing wood and when they do a full roar it's sort of a we're just trying to turn around there's some big stumps that might give us a flat tire of course we do change a few tires following these animals through the bush Yeah, there we go, it looks like we managed to get out of that tricky, tricky spot. I just want to see where that female is going, but while we go have a look, I'm just going to go around behind the young male. Remember, there are other people out here. Whoopsie, watch out, Vim. I've never lost a cameraman yet. I've come close a few times. Get a really cool little sneak peek of that young male from the back of this termitaria. There you can see the shadow of our vehicle as we sneak around. There we go. There he 
he is. He's still lying there. She's come back actually, but we'll look at him first. And there we go. You can see that satellite collar there, as I was explaining earlier. He unfortunately caught a rabid dog and had to go away into quarantine. Now, very unusual behavior we're seeing here. That's because he's come back after being gone for so many months and she's already had other cubs so he's probably quite confused he thinks she's calling for him so he keeps answering but she keeps attacking him growling at him chasing him away because she's actually calling for the next generation her another another cub but there is a strong possibility that that cub could have been killed by this young male it is all very complex out here in the african bush so especially oh listen to her she's still calling Now we've got a really interesting question from Tony and especially with all the vocalization we're hearing at the moment it's really relevant. Tony would like to know do we ever do leopards ever make warning calls for their cubs to hide? They do Tony normally they'll growl at something that's threatening the cubs and that and that will sort of be cue for the cubs to make a disappearing act. But leopards often are forced to leave their cubs alone for many hours at a time while they go hunting and that's when those cubs normally get killed so she will leave them in what's a sort of safe place at this age the cubs can climb but when something like that is going after them he can climb as well so a really really difficult situation for this female leopard and i really feel for her and i'm really hoping that cub survived but while we see what plays on here Let's go back to Steph, who's marching through the African bush. We found for you a giant skewer. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, I'm Steph Winterbull, and we are on foot in the middle of the African bush, right here at Juma Private Game Reserve in the Kruger National Park. And like I said, this is a giant sized elephant skewer. Have a look at this. And how do I know that? I know that because of all these marks. This is where the elephant's teeth rubbed off the bark. Have a look at that. And he did this in a circular motion. And I'm gonna show it to you now, give you an idea of how strong these animals actually are. They put it in their mouth, turned it around, and it came out the other side, just like this. <laughs> as funny as that looks. And they got to the end, when he got to the end, he just dropped it. And then he carried on for more. This is the tree that he got it from. It's a combretum. Literally just bent it over, broke it, and then put it in their mouth. And can you imagine an elephant as big as what it is gets its sustenance from just that little piece of bark right there. That's where the tree's goodies sit. It's where a lot of water and moisture sit. It's also where a lot of sugars and other nutrients lie. The wood of the tree is literally just to get it up into the sky so that it can get some sunlight. The actual good bits, the pieces that the elephant are after, are just this little piece. I'm trying to find a, a place where I can show you how big an elephant's tooth actually is and I think this is it. This is, that is as big as an elephant's tooth. You can see my hand there. I don't have the world's biggest hands, but this was one molar in their mouth. Now they get molars just like we do. They've just only got four, one on each side and then one at the bottom on each side. And they get compressed from the back forward against their tusks when they get old. And we always know when an elephant's at its oldest, when they get to their last set of teeth, they get six, we only get two. But on that note, and before I take a bite of this juicy morsel, Jamie's got a vulture that might fly away before you go back to her. You're going back to her. Enjoy. Luckily for us, our vulture's not planning on flying anywhere. But another one of our much maligned, but actually much misunderstood scavengers. On your live safari, my name is Jamie, and you're on the back of the vehicle at the best possible time. Because as you can see, the afternoon light is starting to set in as the sun sets. 
and we've just managed to make our way out from the middle of that really thick dense vegetation and back out onto a road uh, we, when you last left us we were with Mvula that male leopard and we're now right in the center of Juma private game reserve in the Sabi sand in the greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa an area that is famed for its incredible wildlife spectacles but we really did get absolutely some of the best that Africa really truly has to offer this afternoon. I haven't given up on Mvula just yet. We're going to go for a quick loop around where he disappeared and see if we can't see him where he pops out. So 